The next question we're going to have a look at, it says answer all parts. Part A1. In the context of atomic orbitals, explain penetration, shielding and the effect of nuclear charge. And we have four marks, so obviously we're not looking to write essays, but we need to have sufficient points to achieve the four marks. So this is 3A1. You notice that I've started on a new page here. So we've got penetration, shielding and effective nuclear charge. Penetration basically describes the proximity of electrons in an orbital to the nucleus. We can also say that electrons which experience greater penetration experience less shielding and therefore a larger effective nuclear charge, which I'm going to call ZF from now on. So electrons which experience greater penetration experience less shielding and therefore a larger effective nuclear charge but we could say they shield other electrons more effectively. Further information we could put in this answer, we comparing orbitals within the same shell, we say that the s orbital is more penetrating than p or d orbitals, meaning basically that an electron in an s orbital has a greater chance of being located closer to the nucleus than an electron in a p or d orbital. For example, you could mention that an electron in an s orbital has a finite but very small probability of being located quite close to the nucleus. If you recall, we drew out some of the radial functions. We saw how you got the small node very close to the nucleus. ZF, we need to define that as well. So the effect of nuclear charge is the amount of positive charge on the nucleus that's perceived by an electron. Perhaps the only thing we need to also mention, we haven't kind of defined shielding in too great detail at birth. Basically, shielding describes the amount of screening from nuclear charge that one electron can do with respect to its neighbouring electrons. You could also expand here and say that electrons that have greater penetration can get closer to the nucleus and effectively block out the charge from the electrons that have less proximity. And the value of our effective nuclear charge will provide information on how much charge an electron actually experiences. Question A, part two. This asks you to write down the ground state electronic configurations of chlorine and bromine. Using Slater's rules, work out the effective nuclear charge for an electron in the 3p orbital of fluorine and the 4p orbital of bromine. So this is now A, part 2. Writing out the electronic configuration, that should be easy. For chlorine, Z is equal to 17. And so it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. For bromine, we've got Z is equal to 35. And so we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, 4s2, and 4p5. And you would have got one mark for writing down the correct electronic configuration here. Okay, so now we need to use Slater's rule to work out the effect of nuclear charge, and we're looking at an electron in the 3p orbital. So remember you need to recall Slater's rules. Let's write the electron configuration down again. It would be easier. 3s2, 3p5. Okay, so we're just going to consider one of these electrons. So we've obviously got four other electrons in the 3p orbitals. And we've also got two electrons in our 3s orbitals. Four electrons in the 3p orbitals plus the two electrons in the 3s. They obviously have the same principal quantum number, here n is equal to 3, so they shield at a value of 0.35 according to Slater's rules. So we'd need to have 6 times 0.35 because we've got 4 here and 2 here. Our next principal quantum number is 2, so 2 electrons in our 2s and 6 electrons in our 2p orbital. And now we're looking at n is equal to 2, so it's an n minus 1 compared to the electron we're interested in, which is in 3p. And so that, according to Slater's rules, would have a shielding of 0.85, and so we'd need to be bringing in 8 times 0.85, because we've got 8, 6 plus 2 down here. Finally, the last electrons are in our 1s orbital. So we've got two electrons in 1s orbitals, and that's obviously now n is equal to 1. Now we're looking at n minus 2 compared to our 3p electron, 
and that has a shielding of 1, so we'd be looking since we've got two electrons of 2 times 1. So we need to basically add all of that together, so our effective nuclear charge can then be determined if you recall from Zf is equal to Z minus S. We were trying to work out S up here, so S is going to be equal to 6 times 0.35 plus 8 times 8, 0.85 plus 2 times 1.0. If you work that out, that should be 10.9. And so Zf is going to be equal to 17 from Z minus 10.9 from S, which gives you a value of 6.1 for chlorine. And you would need to then essentially go through exactly the same thing for bromine. But here you're looking at the 4p orbital of bromine. So remember you'd need to look at the electronic configuration again. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, 4s2, 4p5. And so you're considering one of the electrons in the 4p orbital. And so you'd need to go through and work out that the remaining two electrons in the 4s and the remaining four in the 4p have the same value as n. These are n minus 1 in the 3s, 3p and 3d. This is n minus 2 and below then is for 1s, 2s and 2p. So anything from n minus 2 or below then you count as 1. And so without going through that in too much detail, what you end up for s in this case would be 6 times 0.35. So that's the four remaining 4p electrons and two from our 2s there, 0.35 because it's the same value of n. We have 18 times 0.85, so 18 because we've got 10 in our 3d, 6 in our 3p and 2 in our 3s, that gives you 18. But it's n minus 1, so it's 0.85. And then plus 10 times 1. And it's 10 because we have 6 in 2p plus 2 in 2s plus 2 in 1s. And they're n minus 1 or below. So that would be shielding value of 1.0. Here would be a shielding value of 0.85. And here would be a shielding value of 0.35. So if you add that up, that comes to 27.4. And so we can work out Zf is equal to, again, Z minus s. So we've now got 35 minus 27.4, which gives you 7.6. And if you go back to the original question, you can see that there were seven marks available for that question. So one mark was given for giving the correct electronic configuration, so half a mark for each. And then running through all of that, you would have got three marks in total for chlorine and three marks in total for working out ZF for bromine. The next question asks us which of the following sets of quantum numbers are allowed, and we've got a table below here, to which atomic orbitals do the allowed combinations correspond? And you can see that it's worth three marks. So we're looking now at B, part one. So we had N, L, and ML. So the numbers that we had was 2, 2, 2, 5, 3, minus 2, 3, minus 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, and 4, 0, 1. So which ones are allowed? Straight away hopefully you can see that this first one was not allowed, and that's because the maximum value of L is equal to N minus 1, whereas here our value of L is equal to N, so that wouldn't be allowed. So now we've got N is equal to 5, L is equal to 3, and ML is equal to minus 2, and that would be allowed. And that would actually correspond to a 5f orbital. So recall you'd need to know that if you're looking at L, L is equal to 1, 2, 3. So that's L is equal to 0 is an s orbital. L is equal to 1 is a p orbital. L is equal to 2 is a d orbital. L is equal to 3 is an f orbital. So that should tell you straight away it's f. This tells you it's 5. And minus 2 just tells you it's one of the f orbitals. What about the next one? We've got 3, minus 1 and 1. Well, that's not allowed, and that's due to the fact that L can't be negative. Next one, we've got 2, 1, 1. So 2 is fine for N, 1 is fine for L, because that would be a P orbital, as shown here, and ML is equal to minus L up to plus L, so that's fine for ML to equal 1, and that is actually a 2P orbital. And the final one, we've got N is equal to 4, well, that would be OK. L is equal to 0, so that could be a 4s orbital. However, this isn't allowed because 
remember that ML can only take values from minus L to plus L. And here L is equal to zero and we've got a value of ML of one, so therefore that one's not allowed. And that would basically give you the three marks by correctly identifying 5S and 2P are allowed and that the other three are not allowed. So relatively straightforward there as long as you can recall what the quantum numbers are and what values they can take. The last part of this question asks us to sketch the radial part of the wave function r to the r and the radial distribution function of the 3s, 3p and 3d orbitals, clearly labelling the relative phases using plus or minus signs and any radial nodes. So let's start with 3s. So the way we would do this, obviously it's not to scale, it's a sketch. That's the key in the question. However, you do still need to label it clearly so that you can get full marks. So the way that we need to do this late to work out how to draw the radial function is we need to work out the number of radial nodes. And the number of radial nodes for any orbital is n minus l minus 1. So for 3s, n is equal to 3. It's an s orbital, so l is always equal to 0. So therefore, the number of radial nodes is 3 minus 0 minus 1, and so we'd have two radial nodes. Let's draw out the radial function, that's r to the r, and you need to clearly label the axes. So we've got distance, the nucleus r, and here r to the r. So for s orbital, we start positive, in this case exponentially, come down, we pass the x-axis and we then come back because we've got two radial nodes and so there's a radial node as it crosses the axis and there's another node. So here it's going from positive to negative to positive. So what about the other orbital was 3p? So again we can work out the radial nodes, so n minus l minus 1, n is obviously equal to 3, now it's a p orbital so l is equal to 1. So we have 3 minus 1 minus 1 and so in this case we just have one radial node. So again just drawing out a quick sketch, label the axis clearly, that's r to the r up here. So for p orbital we start at zero, go positive and then we cross the axis once because we have one radial node. So this would be positive and this would be negative. And the last one is 3d. So again, n minus l minus 1, so n is equal to 3, now l is equal to 2, so it's 3 minus 2 minus 1, therefore we have no nodes. And just like with a p orbital, so draw the quick sketch, r to the r, r. So again, we start at 0 for a 3d orbital, necessary because we've got an angular node in the 3d orbital and we don't cross the axes so that's positive the whole time because we have no radial nodes. The question also asked us to draw out the radial distribution function. So again it's very important that you clearly label your axes and I'm going to draw a sketch at the side of our radial function. For our radial distribution function, label the axes, we're looking at 4 pi r squared, r to the r squared. And that's again against r. We're looking at the square and obviously in terms of the surface area of the sphere, we're going to still end up with two nodes. So we end up with 1, 2, 3 lobes in that way. So that's our 3s. Okay, and when we do our 3p, again you need to label clearly, so it's 4 pi r squared, r to the r squared. Now we've only got one radial node, so we're looking at one. Again, you may want to indicate that these are nodes here. Here we've only got one, and when we come to the 3d, it's actually going to look very similar we have no radial nodes, 4 pi r squared, r to the r squared, and so it's going to look like that. Okay, so let's just go back to the question, see if we've answered everything. So sketch the radial part of the wave function, the radial distribution function, clearly labelling the relative phases and any radial nodes. So again, these were obviously all positive now because they're squared and we've indicated the plus or minus signs. And so that's worth six marks, and so therefore you'd get one mark for each correctly drawn sketch. But you'd only get a full one mark if, if your axes were labelled clearly, you would indicated the node as well. Okay, so that's basically that question now complete and fully answered.